Um, welcome to our captivating panel discussion on culture, the future of the culture sector in the region. I am super honored and pleased to be joined by our amazing panelists. I'll be starting from the very far right with Kareem, who's a partner at Strategy and Middle East. Abdullah, who's the director of Ithra, the cultural center in Saudi. Sheikh Kareem, who's the acting deputy CEO at Qatar Museums. And Faisal, who's the editor in chief of Arab News. Today, we'll be looking at the cultural sector in the Middle East. It's been over the past you know, decade, undergoing a lot of massive transformation. And all of the sort of different aspects that come out of that in terms of the narratives that we've been able to sort of communicate, all the different aspects of what sort of culture encompasses. And we when we talk about culture, we're looking at everything in terms of our collective knowledge, our beliefs, our customs, our practices. Culture defines who we are as groups and as societies, and it intersects with every part of our lives. Um, and within the culture space, when we talk about the culture sector, we're not just talking about culture when, in terms of the arts um, or museums or physical spaces, but it goes beyond that. It goes to our history, it goes to education, it goes to the economy, it goes to society. And to give us like a quick overview of what has been taking place, I would love to sort of pose this question to all of you. Where are we today in terms of sort of the cultural development that has taken place in the region? Who would want to kick us off? Would you like us to volunteer or would you like to choose your prey? I would love for you to volunteer. <laughs> All right. So uh, good afternoon, everybody. I realize it's, we have the tough job of uh, keeping the audience awake after a fantastic lunch that we've had, so we will do our very best. Um, I am delighted to be here. Thank you um, for that uh, introduction. Um, I'm here to argue that this is probably not only the most important topic of the day, but the most important topic in the science of what has become known as nation brands. So the founder, uh, the person who coined the term is actually a British political scientist called Simon Annold, and he did that in the late uh, 90s um, at uh, Oxford uh, University. And the, the concept of a nation brand has six pillars, basically. Um, tourism, culture, uh, investment and uh, immigration, uh, the people, uh, the type of government, and most importantly, uh, out of all the six, is uh, culture. And this is not my theory, this is his theory. And he says, out of all of the six uh, aspects that create, uh, what creates a nation brand in our minds? So when you think about a country like Japan or a country like Italy or a country like Saudi Arabia or Qatar or Egypt, um, the most important aspect of uh, all of these six is the culture, because it's the only one that cannot be manufactured. Mm -hmm. So you either have it or not. And distinctly, countries that have a rich culture, if you think like a country uh, like Japan, for example, there is a reason why sushi is eaten all the way from Tokyo to Toronto. Uh, there's a reason why martial arts and anime are popular all around the world. They have a very strong culture. The same can argue, be argued about uh, Italians. The same can be argued about Egypt. Um, what we have been going through in uh, the Arab world uh, recently is very encouraging, although it does come after a long uh, sabbatical that, that we've had uh, for various reasons. One of them is some of us might have been ashamed of their own culture. Some of us didn't have the resources or the means to promote uh, or uh, encourage our culture. Um, in, in my country, in, in Saudi Arabia, we even had religious reasons why we couldn't, uh, extreme religious reasons why we couldn't celebrate uh, our culture. But what we've seen, and I'm, this is the last point I'm going to um, uh, end here, uh, what we've seen in the last few years, uh, at least from a Saudi uh, perspective, at least from uh, wide, the wider Gulf, um, uh, we've seen a massive investment. And I, I, when I say investment, I don't mean going and buying art from another country. I'm saying investing in your own. Um, um, so if you look at the uh, efforts in a place like Al Ula, mm -hmm. where French archaeologists are uh, uh, ungrounding uh, pieces that are thousands of uh, years old. One of them is at the display at the Louvre. Uh, this makes us, of course, very proud, but it contributes, definitely contributes to a nation's uh, na uh, nation brand image. That's incredible. Would any of you like to sort of reflect on that or also sort of talk about your own experiences given that sort of you all come from different parts of the cultural sector in terms of where we are today? Yeah. So uh, I'm going to also jump off of some of the points that you've made. 
uh, definitely our voices is what was needed to be heard for that national identities to start coming out. What is our differences, but what is what makes us the same? Um, definitely something that cannot be manufactured is culture and something that you need to work very hard to be able to um, articulate correctly about from your region, from your context. It's not about bringing uh, art from France or art from Europe or the US and saying, here you go, it's an artwork that you need to see. It's more about contextualization and understanding and working throughout your culture. For example, with the National Museum for us was about this understanding our history from prehistoric times until the future, what we are looking forward to. How did we get to where we are rather than it being just a story being told about us from another angle? Um, and that contributed, for example, I think we talked about this, contributed into the education of art history. We, um, in our schools, we did not have this, but even though National Museum was the first museum in the Gulf in the 70s, it was closed from the uh, end of the 90s until we reopened it again in 2019. But to have that element that is all about us and understanding from our context, Yes, we needed to work very hard because there was no presence of museum studies. There was no presence for the profession. There was no studies of all of these different elements where, which we are not only building audience now for, but professionals to be in this environment and to be able to speak and to understand and, con and convey all the messaging that comes with building a nation. I like that there's two elements to this, some that's like more outworld facing and some mm. that's more inward facing to sort of you know the education system mm. versus the nation branding. Abdullah, I don't know if you have something to add to this. Yeah, first of all, I just want to say thank you for being hosted here, uh, despite any passing on the opportunity to join the MBA here, uh, despite getting accepted. So Francois, thank you. And then it was my last not to come here in the end. Um, the, uh, my, my, um, I want to paint the context because I think it's important. Mm. It's very difficult to understand, I think, particularly the Saudi context that Faisal was alluding to. You have an entire generation that have zero exposure to arts, mm -hmm. like none, right? They've never been to a museum. They've never seen a painting. Maybe a few who travel abroad get to do that, but when they travel abroad, they tend to do entertainment. Uh, uh, there's no soft sciences or social sciences studied. And so the context we operate in is one of, I think, virgin land. And that has an advantage because it's preserved, um, but it has a challenge in that the country is completely opening up and the region is opening up to the world. And so how do you do that? And I think that's where culture is today. This, this giant that's being awakened. Um, and you want to make sure that it stands upright on its own um, without, uh, without being too much influence uh, so that it's preserved. Um, and I think that's the role of the various, I think, aspects you have on the panel, whether it's the media, the public sector, uh, nonprofit institutions, or uh, some of the services that support that to ensure that as this creator, uh, culture and creative sector grows in, in the region, uh, it does so with the right intentions in mind because it's, uh, it's more important, in my opinion, than uh, many things else. I, I always like the analogy that um, a lot of what's happening in the region is hardware, mm -hmm. and hardware is great, like, it's wonderful. Culture is a software. Right? And, uh, and software is really unique. Um, it's what, get people, uh, what gives you a unique value proposition um, from a business standpoint. Right? And so we need to protect that software, develop it internally, and own the source code. Um, otherwise, um, you're just a portrayal of somebody else's uh, software. I love the analogy. It speaks to your background as an engineer. Yeah, yeah somewhat, <laughs> a little bit. Kareem, what is your views? Um, First, thank you. Thank you for it. It's great to be here uh, and concur with all the views that are being held. I'll tackle it a little bit from what, how we see in the work that we do in terms of building this bigger ecosystem. When we say culture, maybe everybody's thinking about you know, the big museum that opened or the painting or, or whatever. That's definitely an important part of it. But for that to work and also for it to be an authentic expression of a nation, there's actually a lot of things that are hidden and in the background. Uh, that, that maybe the public doesn't see, but everyone on this panel experiences on a day-to-day -day basis, and that's where all the hard work is going. And in terms of where we are, I think we're very privileged. Uh, we're at a time when globally, uh, cult the culture sector went through a very tough time through COVID. It was an interesting time because many governments recognized that they're losing it if they don't support it, and they invested in it. But as soon as we came out of COVID, we went back to the old fiscal approach uh, of saying culture is a lower priority, let's worry about gas prices. Whereas you go to the Middle East, 
and it's a golden moment uh, for culture. It's an investment in, in the billions across uh, all the countries, in particular in the GCC and the countries around, around the panel. And it's going into infrastructure, it's going into policy, it's going into regulatory bodies, it's going into talent development, it's going into events. And if we look at Saudi, for example, uh, one of the, um, the way they define their aims for their cultural strategy are three things. Culture as a way of life, which is all about engagement. It's all about trying to catch up with the missing opportunity. Of course, the region has been a cradle for culture for, you know, from ancient times, but it has never been recognized to this extent. And between Qatar, UAE, and Saudi, I think we're getting to this level of recognition. So way of life, we want our, our citizens to engage in culture and to enjoy it and to appreciate it. Culture as an economic driver, which is very important because we need to not repeat perhaps some of the, uh, you know, the state that culture sectors in other parts of the world have reached where it's either completely dependent on government and cannot survive a day without it or completely dependent on donations and cannot survive a day without it. So we want to make sure that it's sustainable in some form. There'll always be a need for government support, but that's another one. And the third one is culture as a means of international exchange. And, you know, for a region that's basically been known for a long time for the, wrong, for the wrong types of headlines, isn't it great to have suddenly headlines that are talking about uh, collaborations on museums or collaborations on archaeological digs or collaborations on artist residencies and so on? And this openness and this new Middle East that's being created, this investment in culture is really a drive towards that. And I'd much rather see those headlines and, and this investment in people rather than the headlines we're used to. So a very privileged moment for the region. It absolutely is, and I think it's quite important what you said about sort of the broader ecosystem that supports the culture sector, whether it's, you know, within the training, within sort of the policies, within the different stakeholders getting engaged as well. Um, to take us back a little bit to more the physical space of culture, uh, Dima, I would love to sort of hear your views on how you envision the role of museums and sort of cultural um, institutions playing a role in the region and how they would continue to sort of evolve to match both the sort of the changes that are taking place. Well, to to your point a bit about uh, the context of where we are. Actually, uh, when we did the research on the art world in the Gulf, what was it like from the 60s all the way to the beginning of the 2000s? There was a huge push. There was plastic art societies. They went on. Uh, exhibitions together, we have imagery, we have catalogs of them going to different parts of the world, but then if you even go back more from Arab, Arab art specifically, you see that they're actually part of the bigger movements, all the art movements, they are part of it. They're not an afterthought, they didn't come to emulate the West, they were there and a part of it. And even the influences to some of these artists, Giacometti, many others, have have come to the have come to us to look at at our art and look at our history and started emulating and started working off of it. So this kind of I want to like take the context back to we're not running after something or coming behind something. We are, have always been in the forefront. It's about the narrative and the lens that we were seen through or are being seen through. So opening museums like Matahaf Arab Museum of Modern Art being intentional about putting the dates on every caption so you can see when these artists were working, when these artworks were being created, and then you look at the art movement that they were a part of. It's not something that <laughs> the people were just copying. Um, but I think this also brings us to now and the future. Museums around the world uh, have been open for hundreds of, hundreds of years, have been, um, people come to them without much effort actually. Some museums, we work with a lot of different international museums and we have these larger discussions of what is the museum. And I come actually just changed the, the, um, the net, what a museum means because we were all able to participate in this meaning. It was the first time where everybody from all around the world was actually asked what it is and negotiated until we came down to a specific meaning, which we're not a place anymore to just house objects. We are a place of knowledge. We're a place for tangible and intangible heritage. We're a place for research, for community, for society. And this is the basis of all of the museums that are actually being built right now. How do you look at now? What does the, your community and your world need now? And what will they need in the future? You don't need a past museum. Museum. Mm -hmm. They need a 21st century museum. They need a future museum. We're hoping that any of these museums being created around the region to last for 100 years, 1,000 years. And what does that look like for us? That means it needs to be sustainable, like you're saying. Uh, it's not something that you can 
today I'll have these people and tomorrow nobody will be there. You need the knowledge to be transferred, you need to grow, you need the pipeline of creativity, you need the artists, you need the creatives, you need the, uh, the archaeologists, you need all kinds of professions that are actually opening up because we need them now. These were not something that you would need, but you'll need them even more for the future than this current moment. And the pipeline needs to exist and the funding for that pipeline needs to exist. The, the spaces for them also need to exist. That's incredible, taking it from like a window to the past to a car driving us to the future or maybe like some more futuristic vehicle. Yeah. Um, would any of you want to sort of like follow on on that, like from the different sort of sectors that you're in in terms of how do we continue to move forward in terms of the cultural space while still sort of preserving all culture and not and sort of being able to communicate it to the younger generation, you know, the people that haven't visited museums before that sort of think in their minds, oh, I'm just going to go look at objects, but rather this sort of sharing that newer understanding. I will take that, if you don't mind. Um, I think we are living in a moment where, for various reasons, I mean, there is a concept called institutional failure. Um, the reverse of that concept is when th everything starts going right, and I think this is what we are going through um, Touchwood now, um, at least in the in the Gulf region, and hopefully um, this positivity will will spread. One of the aspects uh, is definitely uh, culture. Uh, as I alluded to in my previous answer, a lot of the barriers to entry uh, that were there, whether it was, it was religious extremism, whether it was lack of resources, whether it was lack of bandwidth and, uh, and interest, or lack of expertise. Um, as I said, you know, we have some of the best French archaeologists in the world working in Al Ula uh, uh, at the moment uh, to uncover these uh, treasures. Uh, it is quite an achievement to be able to lend an art uh, piece to uh, the Louvre. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so uh, I, I just think it will, it's going to take us a bit of more. I think we're putting all, planting the right seeds. It's going to take us a bit more time. But we're going to get to a point, uh, citrus paribus, as they say in Latin, all things held constant. Um, the international, and as you know, there are two types of people. Uh, who travel, you know, you're either going for a beach and sun holiday or a history and heritage uh, holiday. The people who travel for history and heritage, they've probably already seen the Leaning Tower of uh, Pizza, Piazza, uh, Pizza. Uh, they've seen the Eiffel Tower, um, so uh, they've seen the pyramids. Um, what we're offering um, in Saudi Arabia or in, in the wider Gulf is an opportunity to see things they haven't experienced before. I cannot even begin to tell you um, the feedback I get from people who visit Al Ula uh, for the first time. And you know, for those who don't know, uh, Al Ula is uh, the same civilization of the Nabataeans, who uh, you probably all heard of Petra. So the same people, uh, when they were conquered by the Romans, fled to Saudi Arabia. They created the city five times uh, the size of, of, of Petra, and it's just held uh, intact. I mean, one of probably the blessings of the, uh, thankfully, the religious extremism that we don't have to deal with anymore uh, is nobody visited, so it wasn't ruined. Uh, and now the preservation and the restoration that's happening is beyond belief. So I think we are living in a moment where uh, generally uh, the people who travel for history uh, and heritage are naturally going uh, to come uh, to uh, Saudi Arabia, they're gonna come to Qatar, they're gonna come to the UAE, and people rarely visit, uh, just like, for example, when people visit Jordan uh, or the Palestinian territories, they visit uh, Israel also. So people who travel for that, they want to go on uh, a track and, and see different uh, um, monuments. So um, I think we're, on, we're headed toward that, that direction and provided things continue with this positivity and this uh, um, uh, investment, uh, I think we're onto something really, really great in the next few years. I was going to add something, so on a much more oper operational level, so I, I, I had a in cultural institution, um, and uh, I'd say the, the future of these cultural institutions is going to be very different, and the advantage of starting with a blank page uh, has big uh, uh, advantages. So one, just to give you some stats, so Ithra gets a million visitors per year. Uh, the population around Ithra is 1.5 million, right? So the, the portion of people attending is uh, proportionately high. The repeat visitation we get is six times uh, um, per year, which uh, according to the global average is three times higher than the global average. Um, so I, I think the, the context helps, but also designing cultural institutions with maybe a couple of things in mind. One, um, the, 
multidisciplinary aspect of culture. So there's been a lot in the last two years about NFTs and metaverse and what constitutes as culture and art and what it doesn't. And I think the embracing of the fluidity of that conversation is critical for future uh, cultural institutions. Um, uh, more established, uh, historical, hundreds of years of old institutions struggle with this, I think, a bit more. The second one is uh, the uh, localization aspect. So this is really important, it's something that Qatar does extremely well, um, which is a cultural institution in Qatar should feel like a Qatari cultural institution. Um, that is of, with a global conversation. Mm. But it is a Qatari cultural institution. I should not be able to go there and just take that institution and place it in a different part of the world and see it. And so I need to see the local aspect of it, regard, if, even if it's about, uh, I don't know, if it's about uh, uh, Latin culture, but it's in Qatar. I, could, I should feel a cultural relevance to the, uh, to the region it's in. And I think these new cultural institutions in the region have that advantage. And then the third and final one, I think that's uh, the future, is uh, this uh, uh, focus on youth. So uh, I think most of the people here are under uh, 40, I was going to say. Um, let me just raise of hands, how many people have been to a museum in London the last year? Right, so if you raise those numbers in Saudi, uh, that would be much smaller. Uh, but if, if you were to split, yeah, I mean, yeah, thank you. But um, we are a nation where 70% of the population is under 35. Um, and so we design our programs and, our, uh, uh, and our, why we've been successful has been very youth-centric. So if, you go to, if you've been to the Tate or the V&A, the volunteers there are predominantly seniors. People who have graduated, uh, they've um, retired, and they've wanted to give back. Um, in Ithra, 95% of people who volunteer are under the age of 30, mm. right? So that's a completely different operational model, completely different shift. It's the future of cultural institutions. The v is going to open young v uh, in, a, in a month's time in an attempt to try and catch up on this, and I think that's the future of cultural institutions. I want to add a couple of things as well, Tara. Look, If we want a future for a culture sector that is actually sustainable and thriving, we also need to do some of the long sprint, long marathon type activities. So, all the studies tell you that if young children are, are exposed to culture early on, then they grow into adults who appreciate it, and some of them will actually want to be in it. So we need to make sure that in our schools, culture, uh, cultural topics are taught, arts, music, and so on, and it's not the case in every country right now, and that's, that's changing. The other thing is, when they do graduate, you want them to actually feel that there is a career for them mm -hmm. in the culture sector, and this comes from you know, awareness, I mean, today, if, uh, if a typical Arab child tells his parents, I'm going to be a painter, all hell breaks loose. You know, what? Not a doctor, not an engineer, not a lawyer, whatever. I mean, you know? Even a filmmaker, how would yeah. you say? It should be, it makes a bit <laughs> like, more money. So, so, so we need awareness for the parents to appreciate the careers. We need awareness for the students who are deciding what they want to do in higher ed or in vocational training, but what the career opportunities are. And this is maybe the boring stuff of culture, but this is really what will make or break it yes. yeah. in, in, in the end. That's very important. And the other thing in terms of accessibility and, and the older people and so on, we're lucky we're in a time where also the definition of culture and creativity is changing because of technology, because of the whole creator economy that has, that has come out. So today, younger, younger children or children and teenagers and so on, they're used to creating. We just maybe, we can, we can have a choice. We can either be all elitist about it and sit in our ivory towers and big institutions with beautiful walls and say, that's not really culture, but it is. It is for this generation, and it is what they'll take forward. Or we can support it, enhance it, and then give them opportunities to actually express it uh, as, as they grow older. So I just want to comment on here. So I get a lot of feedback sometimes from peers, and particularly the media, about some of the things that we do that are not considered art or culture. Right, uh, because by definition of uh, some of the people who are in this space for many years, well, this is not abstract enough. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's not doesn't follow methodologies of specific schools and etc. Um, and uh, my response to that is that that is one definition, uh, and we won't follow it even if there's pressure to do it. Um, and so, who is to say that in order for art to be accepted, that uh, the art needs to be expressed in X, Y, or Z, or that you need to be inclusive in X, Y, or Z format? Um, we, uh, we will only be unique and we will only contribute to the global conversation if we define as a local society, as a region, what we think is our culture and portray it for the world. And that's how you create tolerance, that's how you have conversation. And the point that you raised, I believe, which is around cross-cultural engagement, you know, the international aspect to it. And so it's the, the, that's the core of the future. You need, we, we, can, we should be part of the conversation but not assimilate uh, as well.
I'd just like to add to, to your point. Um, I don't think I ever disappointed. I, look, I found my parents so disappointed uh, as much as when I told them I wanted to be a journalist <laughs> 20 years ago. And like you can see, you see, we, you know, we, ho we were hoping for you to be a doctor or a lawyer. <laughs> it's a very typical um, uh, you know, growing up in the Arab world uh, thing. But I do think what's going to help now is the amount of scholarships yep. that are being invested. I mean, you, even if you wanted to, there was no means or no curriculums mm -hmm. that supported uh, learning, uh, you know, uh, we, we, for example, in, at Arab News, we now, part of our training is we train critics. Like, you know, how do you write uh, a critique? Yeah. Or how do you report on a, a gallery? How, um, you know, how do you interview uh, with, with, with artists? So things are changing. It will take time uh, for sure. But there has been, uh, there is no doubt there's been a paradigm shift over the past uh, few years. Um, and as I said earlier, this is hopefully going to project on the wider, um, uh, wider region. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, on, on the last point about that, which, why it's, it's so interesting. I mean, I, I spend uh, most of my time on a plane. So I was in Estonia the night, two nights before. I'm here in London. I'm flying tonight to Saudi, to Jeddah, and then I'm going to, to Riyadh. And I tell you, as somebody who, who travels, the most frustrating thing is to keep seeing WH Smith, McDonald's, Starbucks, Burger King, <laughs> everywhere. Yep. So, um, so, so, you know, and, and people, you know, uh, you know, you know, from a nutrition perspective, those, I'm not going to comment on those brands, you choose, <laughs> whether you want to, uh, but I, I, what I'm saying is um, the power of the local flavor. And culture also includes food. And one of the things the Ministry of Culture did is the culinary mm. uh, committee. And, um, you know, supporting, um, you know, local uh, cafes and supporting uh, people who produce uh, local food. Um, if you're gonna, um, if you're, you know, if you're gonna visit a country, you probably want to try uh, a different flavor. Um, you know, I referred in my opening comments to countries like Japan and, and Italy, and remarkably, in those two countries, you don't, you know, there are those chains that I mentioned. They are there, but they're not there on every corner. And you know, if you speak to an Italian and you mention Starbucks, you know, they, it's not as bad as telling them you want to put ketchup on pizza, but but it's they will really look down. Uh, they will really look down uh, at you. They wouldn't consider it a coffee. No, 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 absolutely not. And in, you know, if you think about the numbers, um, there is 195 countries in the world and about 8 billion uh, people. Um, the last thing you want is 8 billion of the same. Mm -hmm. You know, you really want to travel, you really want to go and experience something uh, different. And this is why I, I'm a firm believer in what we're trying to do. And you see it, for example, um, in the Saudi World Cup for horses. They could have easily said, come wearing dresses or hats. What they insisted is, please come, even if you're a foreigner, come and try. I mean, you're free to wear whatever you want, but please do try our local abaya or our local tobe. Um, you know, uh, this is a, a, a traditional Arab Arabian horse celebration. Um, the last year was the year of the Saudi coffee. And we sent our reporters to see the, how, how it is brewed, and um, we, we call it the, you know, the, the golden oil. Uh, for Saudi Arabia, and it's, it's, it's really fascinating. And you know what, if you're a, a, ca a coffee aficionado, it really is something different to try. So um, that's why I continue to be uh, hopeful, and I hope I'm not proven wrong. It's, I think, not to like, sort of bring us back to McDonald's, but like I've heard they're making a Kepsa dish oh. in some of the local ones in the Gulf. I hope that's not true, but um, I do agree. I think there is this sort of like, proliferation of like some cultural aspects from specific countries that have sort of taken over, I think, commercially. Um, and I think it's quite important what you were all saying about how do we make sure that from a very young age we get people interested, understand the importance of culture. That's why we're here today right. talking about it. Right. And make sure that they're engaged. But then we also create that ecosystem and that support system for them to have jobs and sort of sustainable lifestyles to be able to sort of continue to work and thrive in this space, to make sure that this space continues to thrive. And I wanted to ask you, Faisal, specifically about sort of, you spoke about having the journalist training for you know, how to be a critic, how to sort of view artists, how to speak to them. What is the role of the media today, especially working with cultural institutions, to make sure that sort of this cultural sort of like development that's taking place in the region is being communicated to the world, but then is there something else that you would want to see in that relationship between the media and the cultural institutions? So I have my own theory, and I constantly argue with my good friend, Professor Simon Arnold, who I referred to in the opening comments that he founded the Term Nation brand. I told him there are seven factors, and countries that have a strong media presence uh, do have an advantage. Mm -hmm. So if you think about the impact of Hollywood or think of the impact of the BBC uh, that you have here, um, it's, uh, well, first, it's a direct way of people accessing 
your culture or understanding more, more you know you know almost the kind of the music of the BBC like when there's breaking news it's almost kind of synonymous in people's mind to breaking news now um, in Arabic when when you say Huna London uh, people people remember uh, the BBC uh, radio so what I'm trying to say is um, I think media has such an important role that I would call it the seventh uh, pillar of the nation brand uh, hexagon um, so Everything we mentioned, um, if you look at something like the Korean uh, experiment, um, uh, I just want to be very careful uh, in, and raise this flag before I continue with what I'm about to say. Um, these things cannot be manufactured. Mm -hmm. um, you know, integrity, uh, quality cannot be promised. It has to be proven. So you cannot suddenly say, you know what, um, I want to do the equivalent of sushi uh, tomorrow and conquer the world with my dish. But something the Koreans have done very well. And I actually recently uh, found this out. So um, in the 80s, probably the predominant Asia, Asian culture was Japan. And um, uh, with, with the economic pickup, and this is what I was referring to, institutional failure and the opposite. So um, in the 90s and the 2000s, you know, it was the era of, of, of Korea. Um, and you had the rise, what we call the, 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 chi the Asian uh, tigers. Uh, and then, you know, with Samsung, Hyundai, uh, et cetera, uh, came prosperity and came a lot of interest um, uh, with, with, with Korea. So um, people discovered uh, K-pop, and people who live in the Arab world perhaps remember Mexican soap operas and how popular uh, they were in the 80s. Um, people now watch in the Arab world Korean soap opera. Uh, in my days, it wasn't very popular. It's the younger generation. In my days, it was Japanese anime. Uh, you know, cartoons such as, you know, Grindizer, Captain Majid. I mean, I'm sure everybody's seen it, but it was, the, the strength of it uh, is that it was an entry point to learn about Japan. So uh, K-pop, whether it's soap operas or music, um, played such a, uh, a big role. Um, if you remember how the song Gangnam Style, for example, uh, swept the world, it went viral. And actually, this is, this is actually true, you can, you can Google this. The Korean Ministry of Agriculture and Fishing um, actually commissioned a K-pop group to promote uh, Korean food. And the result was, I think this happened, if I'm not mistaken, between 2011 to 2017. The number of Korean restaurants ab abroad grew from 9,000 to around 30,000. So uh, what I'm trying to say is media does work. But you know, if you if we're at London Business School, so everybody's familiar with the four P's of uh, of marketing. Product is the first one. You need to have a good product before you think about promotion. But promotion definitely helps. That's incredible. And speaking of the product, I think Abdullah, you spoke about how there was some critique coming in from others that don't consider sort of the, some of the newer things to be part of our culture, or like how do we how do we sort of focus on integrating these trends, but then also creating the broader engagement. Because I think if you look at the younger generation, this is what they care about. They won't care about a painting done 200 years ago. Sure. Um, so I think there are two parts to your question. So first is, I'll draw an analogy. Imagine that the entire Islamic art movement has been uh, not as well covered um, and not accessible for many people. And suddenly, it is accessible. And if you look at it from a completely Western um, or global mindset, you wouldn't be able to understand that art, right? Uh, whether it's from an impressionism or an abstractism or a minimalism standpoint, that doesn't work. And so, if, for example, if I'm the media and I see an exhibit where that's the kind of art that's there, I'm not going to really click with it. I might not cover it because it doesn't really speak to what standards I have. And so, um, this is the context we're in today. I think Saudis, uh, Arabs are experimenting to express the transformation that's in their countries and what they're doing. Um, we as cultural institutions, as regulators, need to uh, back them up uh, and create uh, the platforms for them in order to um, stick to their practice uh, and what they speak. So I think that's important, right? This backing uh, that's there. As, as for, I think, uh, making it accessible for a younger generation, and I, I think you're going to brush up on this later, but I think technology is uh, a really important part. And the second is community, because there are two th aspects of the younger generation that are that appear to be contradictory, but are uh, clear uh, um, aspects of them. One, they're very technologically savvy and connected, no need to dwell on that. And the second, they're extremely experience-driven. 
right? And one can think that those are in contradiction because if they're very tech-based, they might not want to go out and they're isolated. They're actually like experiences. And so museums and et cetera need to do that. I'll just give an example. So in, when we wanted to cover Islamic culture in our big grand exhibit that we opened last year, uh, which is going to tour globally, um, we didn't go with artifacts only. We didn't go with contemporary art only. Uh, we had VR, we had uh, AR. We actually, so the, the exhibit was around um, the pilgrimage of the Prophet, peace be upon him, from Mecca to Medina, and covering that uh, into the wider Islamic history. In order to cover the experience side, I personally walked from Mecca to Medina on foot, um, in order to, me and the team, in order to experience it and then tell that story genuinely and then have every visitor that comes, it's 450 kilometers, right? In order to, tell that story. And so if you, if you put in that effort, I think you can connect with a new generation and uh, portray it. Okay. I'd like to add to that, um, actually to also what you said earlier. Again, in the region, most of the countries are 60% um, under 30. Yep. Uh, and that presents a really interesting opportunity for all of us from an education perspective, from what our future looks like, who you are right now. Um, like you're saying, you had to experience that to be able to make others experience it. And this is about context, context, but this is where we lack with a lot of museums coming in from the West saying like, here, here's a Picasso, but why am I showing a Picasso in Qatar or Saudi? Exactly. Or where, who, who's there to have that dialogue, that discourse to actually make sense for your audience, whether that is uh, someone coming from abroad to look at it there or someone from the country. Like, what, it, what are we doing here? Why are we doing this? And these are the main questions that are being asked and need to be asked when you are creating these kind of opportunities and experience. And definitely for younger kids and younger generation in tech right now, you have to actually look at it again, whether it's experience or is it tech, can you combine the both? NFT was really, really like very fast turnover, um, but also they're creators. A lot of people are now creators, and how do you create that space within a public space? Because we had a huge problem in the Gulf actually with all the spaces being private, very, very much private, and there's a conflict between what is private and public space. People didn't understand, like even on the sidewalk, is this a public space or a private space? But now if we're creating institutions that you don't have to be a part, you don't have to go to this university, you don't have to be a part of this uh, family or this society, you can actually be in this comprehensive space that everybody can communicate in and can experience in. And you have to be very aware of what the future looks like and what you're putting in there. And it's not anymore, it's challenging the old thoughts of what a museum looks like or a creative space looks like because you need to provide the opportunity. The Saudi ambassador earlier had said to everybody, uh, after you finish your education, you need to go back home because there's a lot of opportunity. And that's exactly what needs to happen. We're learning all of this to, for, to actually be able to create within our countries with new thoughts, new ideas, but from our own, um, I don't want to say the word traditional, I don't like that word, uh, but actually look at where our history is going. Do we still live in the desert? Do we still ride a camel? Do we, like all these questions that keep coming up once you're outside of your context, we're not those people. We are from the Gulf, yes, from the Middle East now, but we are now, we are not the past. So we need to now answer for that. What does that look like to us? What some of the, there's a lot of experiences that we've detached from. We have never experienced them. But it's still the Orientalist frame of mind of who we are, which needs to be challenged and is continuously now being challenged. I also, I also want to add, uh, in terms of your question about media and technology, if you combine the two, it's not how culture is going to spread and how cultural identity is going to be expressed is very different today and it will be very different in the future than what we're used to. It's not the old mentality, you know, the government newspaper or the government mm -hmm. television channel or the government whatever is going to tell you about culture, therefore you will understand what it is and take it as prescriptive. Younger people today, they're more, much more interested. If you look at the surveys of where do you get your news, mm -hmm. who, who do you ask about information, it's not the official channels. The official channels themselves have now, the smart ones, have figured out that it's not the official way to go out. You have to go through the, where the audiences are. The audiences are on TikTok, they're on social media, they're mixing and matching, they're rehashing. And what we need to do is divorce the means of exhibition. You know, forget about, I need to have a the beautiful form. display and the beautiful. One of the issues we have in the Arab world is when we start with something, the first thing that we do is pick the architect who's going to do the building. <laughs> this should be like, way down the list of priorities. It doesn't matter if the building is beautiful if nobody walks into it. 
It can make a statement, yes, absolutely. It can put you on the map. To the cultural world, it's extremely important. It gives you credibility, and you put an institution behind it. But if you want the young people to engage, it's exactly this. We need to go outside the walls of the building. And outside the walls of the building means take the narratives that are important to us and let that be something that anybody can play around with and remix and rehash. And you said before, nobody's going to look at a 200-year-old painting. They might if that 200-year-old, so for example, uh, open AI, when they wanted to show the example of Dali, how you can just give it one picture and it, you sort of extend around it to fill in the blanks, they use the classical painting. I bet you, out of the 100 million people who, who go into open it, all of them now understand what that painting is. But they didn't have to go to stand in a formal museum with somebody giving them a lecture about it or read a little plaque in silence. So the more we're open, Engagement is exactly, the more we're open, the more we drop our egos, the more we drop this pretense of culture has to be somehow high class and only for people who are of a certain level of education, the more successful we'll be in having a future for this. Yeah, I, I want to say there are three cancer words that you learn in business school that are very, very uh, problematic when it comes to anything that's not engineering. Um, best practice, benchmark, <laughs> yeah. right? Because, I mean, can you imagine, like, imagine you want to benchmark what a cultural museum is, okay? Or if you want, the, what is the best practice? Now we're going to start arguing. Yeah. <laughs> the consultant <laughs> disagrees. Um, so the idea is, I think you want to analyze what works, you want to go a level deeper, you want to understand the actual insights, but um, the, the, the architecture so analogy that you, you use is very powerful because that's, uh, you can be blinded by brands and by what flashy and forget what you, the unknown unknown that are there. Exactly to this point, we have arguments with clients sometimes because they say, I want to be like X, mm. but you are not X. You're not X. And X had a very different journey of how they got there and why and their history and their country. You have your own culture, you have your own history, and you're at a different moment in, in, in your journey. And we cannot expect a con you know, some of the countries in, in the GCC are younger than I am, not, not wanting to date myself not in terms of their civilization and society, but in terms of being a country that has a government that's supporting a culture sector that's enabling it, right? And so we're in the beginning of the journey. Suddenly everybody comes and they want to judge us based on what they've taken hundreds of years to do, and suddenly they want to call out our faults because, oh, look, you know, they're not doing this like the other day. We're working on this beautiful project in Riyadh, and somebody sitting in Canada writes a little op-ed, and they go, oh, yes, you know, it's not connected to the community, and it's not driving sustainable and a sustainable agenda. And there's a thing in Canada, they've never been. And it's like, okay, so if I go back 30 years, 40 years in your country, what was the state of your cultural sector? What was the state of your sophistication and your understanding? Well, give us time to have our own journey to get what is authentic to us as different peoples. And this, you know, we're not all one people as well. Everybody has different forms of expression. And let us do our thing. And then we'll get to something that, everybody, that is authentic, because exactly to the points that are being mentioned, if today culture is copy-paste, and on, on the projects, to go back to this point, when they say, show me the benchmarks that support why you're telling me to do this, it's not a one a direct correlation. It's just something to look at and then say, what is relevant to me? What that others did is, important, is, is useful to me? What is it that is not useful to me that doesn't fit my identity? And what else can I do that fits where I am today in this moment in time. And it's very important to right. I agree on that. I, I just want to both uh, disagree and agree. So I, I agree 100% with no, you about the, use, uh, about the use of the word traditional. I also don't like it. Where I disagree with my honorable colleague is about uh, when, when you refer to traditional media. That is a definition that keeps on shifting. Mm -hmm. Traditional media today is definitely not a print uh, newspaper. But if we, um, if we look at, for example, something like Netflix, you cannot discount it because there's a bunch of people on TikTok. I mean, TikTok is also important, but just look at the controversy the uh, recent yeah. docu-series yeah. Queen, Queen Cleopatra uh, has done. I mean, Egypt, I, I've, you know, and I've written this in a column, you know, Egyptians usually are the funniest, you know, coolest, uh, easygoing people, except when you insult or try to uh, challenge their culture. Mm -hmm. And they have a right. You know, the culture goes back 3,000 years before Christ. Uh, Jada Smith, with all due respect, the United States altogether is about 275 years old. So the, the, the idea of why the anger, uh, and you know, I don't know if you followed that debate, but it's, my point is it's very important not to ignore the narrative out there and to fight back respectfully and to fight back with facts. Right. The, the, the issue here is um, it's very easy with the current political divisions uh, and the racial politics in America to say, 
you are just against the movie or against the docu-series because uh, you don't like black people, which has nothing to do with why Egyptians are, are, are upset. Egyptians are upset is because Netflix called it a docu-series. When you call it a docu-series or a documentary, correct. Yes. Mm -hmm. you need to be as close as factually correct. Um, unfortunately, we are living in a time where it's more important to be politically correct than factually correct. Right. Actually, the director of the docu-series in an interview with uh, Variety, in a moment of excitement, I think, uh, I think she hung herself because she said, um, what a political act it would have been uh, to uh, cast a black actress in the role of Cleopatra. Just for the record, in case anybody knows, I know this is very trivial information, Cleopatra was actually Greek. Greek yeah. Yeah. So, um, and at that time, it would have been impossible. Uh, people like Zahi Hawass and other uh, famous Egyptian archeologists have books written uh, on the history, and they will tell you that she wasn't an African uh, queen. So, um, the, you know, when I say we shouldn't ignore the media, but we also should work on our narrative. I mean, the argument is very simple. Call it uh, fiction, and do whatever you want. Yeah. Yeah. But if you're gonna call it a docu-series or a documentary, then you need to stick to the facts. I actually wanted to add a bit to uh, what we're saying here about can exporting the sculpture or manufacturing it. It takes more than 10 years to make a museum. And like you're saying, if picking the architect is what you do in the beginning, then you're not, there's no vision for this, there's no collection, there's, why are you doing it? Is, is the biggest question you have to answer for yourself. And it takes a very long time. It's a huge negotiation between the architects, the teams, the curators, the collections. There's a lot of back and forth and also the audience. Why, do, well, why are you making, are you just gonna make a building again for a painting to be hung and then people not come? That's not the purpose here. So you have to, it takes that long. It's not something you can create in one day. And even for creation of art right now, a lot of artists are like, I'm gonna paint today, I'm gonna sell it tomorrow. Mm -hmm. and I'm, but if you think about the great artists, that was not the case for them. Some of their works never sold until like 100 years after they died. So there's a, a bit of speed that is now, uh, we're at hyper speed for everything. Everything needs to be now, needs to be done, needs to be, but in reality, nothing will change unless you go the step by step. If you don't introduce art and culture to kids as, at a younger age, they will not understand or come to uh, even want to be part of that culture or part of that profession growing up. And we've seen these examples within our region. It's, I'm one of those examples. I was one of the last people to go to the National Museum as a, as a kid for a school tour. They closed it after that, but all the generation after me had nowhere to go from a museum perspective until 2008. So there's a gap there, so, and then this is when you see people actually going into the field and wanting because they know that there's an opportunity when they come back and there's so much that is happening. It's not something that, it's the same as like people studying um, engineering, like petrochemical, all of that because there's oil in the region or journalism because they know there are these big media companies now. So you have to create the opportunity and you have to allow for that organic growth and not expect it to be turnover tomorrow. That's not, that's not gonna work. Absolutely, I think we are, we are here today because there were the few pioneers that decided to sort of take the risk and yeah. sort of go into the space and take the risk and sort of come back to the region. Um, on the point you made about uh, sort of like we're going at such an accelerated speed, but there's also the need to slow down. How would you all see sort of like some of the solutions that we can take here? Because we don't wanna lose the momentum that's been gained, both sort of like with the general engagement, but also with the investment that's being made. But how do we go about it in the right way? I think we just need to go uh, faster uh, in combating uh, the trend that's there. Yeah. So I'll use technology as an example. Um, so we launched a couple of years back a huge global program on understanding the prevalence, their prevalence uh, and profilation of technology with youth. And it was, again, for a cultural institution, why would you do that? That sounds like more like a think tank or a research-based institution's role. But the reason we did is because we think technology and culture are basically one and the same now. Um, and so just some facts. Uh, do we agree that the people you hang out with and your circle impacts your culture? I think that's yes. Um, 50% of global youth uh, and uh, Gen Z um, say they would rather lose their uh, um, friend forever mm -hmm. than lose their phone, right? <laughs> this, is like, uh, this is across 30 countries, uh, 15,000 people surveyed, okay? Um, uh, another fact, um, how many people, the last thing they do 
before they go to sleep is use their phone. And the first thing they do when they wake up is use their phone. Over, over 90%, all <laughs> right? 40% of people around the world say they have completely different personalities online than they have in real life. Like their persona online, what they portray and what they take photos in Instagram with, and oh, I'm very happy, but they're actually depressed, they have completely different personalities. This is pure like cultural uh, impact. Um, and so in order to, if there's huge speed, whether it's technological speed or various others, what needs to come in is, uh, is comp uh, other speeds that either complement or support. So the, the, exa the simplistic example of this, if people are gonna use technology that heavily, there are two things that need to happen. One, there needs to be our culture and our content on these platforms. It's super critical. I grew up, uh, YouTube is prevalent. Uh, um, YouTube, Arabic content and cultural content uh, on YouTube is 0.0 or something percent. I think Google's rough estimate is 3%. Um, the Arab world makes up much more of that. So there needs to be way more content on YouTube that's Arabic and cultural and local and DIYs in Arabic and like how do you wear your shmar, right? And you can Google it and you can see it on YouTube just as a way that you can uh, Google in YouTube how do you tie your tie and all of that sort of things. And that also means uh, language, right? Um, and then the other thing is um, production of original content. And like Arab News does this very well, various other platforms where we, we produce a huge number of films and podcasts. If you are able to, number one, um, raise awareness about these platforms and the uses of them, and then be part of them and, come back and uh, offer an alternative, then you can start slow down or maybe uh, guide that uh, acceleration. I don't think you can stop it. That's maybe in short. Uh. Um, I think a, a, I agree with you on that part a little bit to a certain extent, but I also agree that it's about the investment. We are looking now, what are these big investments? We, you can throw money at anything and you can make it happen immediately but what are you investing in now that will make the difference later on? And this is where governments and policies and you need to look at all the different elements that create that culture at the end of the day and what projects are you investing in to actually do that, but also having that time. Uh, we face that a lot where we all of a sudden, oh, there's this opportunity to do this. You have to weigh the risks and the investment on, on this kind of opportunity. Sometimes you need to take it and it actually ends up being something you could do or do well. But at the same time, you have to have that ability to assess critically, would this make, would this make sense to us at this moment or in the future and not accept everything same. blindly? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And sometimes it's the same thing. So yeah. if we take, for example, a film production, an international film produced in your country, mm. There's a big rush in there. Well, let's get them to come shoot it. Okay, that's useful to some extent because today, getting one of your stories into a film or onto an, a Netflix series is probably one of the fastest ways to spread, spread the sense of identity exactly. about yourself and, and change the narrative. So that's great. But if at the same time, while they're shooting, you put some young students from, uh, from your country onto the crew who have never been on a film set before, or, and, or you, you let them shadow everybody, or you make the assistant director somebody from the country, then when the production leaves, you still have something that's building slowly for the long term. And it's, you have to play the fast game yeah, and the exactly. slow game at the same time. That. But also the same thing about when you said uh, lending to the Louvre, and uh, Qatar has been doing that a lot with our loans everywhere, even the Met, and sometimes it's on the cover of the book. But it's not about the, it's about, again, this is a long-term strategy people being able to go into these museums and see the names of our Gulf region on, on the labels to know where these collections are actually coming from is huge publicity for all of us. And we're very proud to be able to lend these collections to help curate these amazing shows that wouldn't be done without us. But at the same time, how much of that are we betting on? Is, is a big question that we have to ask them. Because it's not a one-time thing. We need to keep on doing it until it becomes uh, you have that richness to it rather than a one-time opportunity. Absolutely, and, and I do think Qatar has been pioneering uh, on that front. And uh, just for the record, I have uh, no issues with lending. Uh, I have an issue, I have a very strong issue with uh, unconsensual borrowing, to use it politely. Yeah. 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 Um, and I was very pleased to see the Iraqi president after the coronation of uh, King Charles uh, uh, negotiate the return of some Iraqi uh, artifacts to Iraq. Yeah. And I think we should all get together and insist the Rosetta Stone is returned exactly. from the British right. Museum to uh, Egypt, where it belongs. Oh. Absolutely.
I think we can spend three, four hours just on this topic alone, but unfortunately we're gonna soon be at time. So I just wanna ask like a final question to all of you. What is one thing that you'd want to see in the next decade in this sector? Mm. Katie, would you wanna uh, I'm gonna start. Oh. Uh, there are many, I think, big obvious answers, but maybe one that's a bit, uh, and I was talking to somebody earlier about, I, I think the, um, the pride like the installation, the inst instilling pride, awareness, and modernization of the Arabic language yeah. is critical for the next 10 years. Um, we need a global, we need to be global. Arab News, for example, does an incredible job of making sure our story is finally told from the region, but the, the actual localities, the public, need to speak Arabic, understand Arabic, and uh, understand, you know, and a few of you are laughing, but uh, uh, for those of you who spend time in the Arab world, particularly in the GCC, um, the uh, literacy in the Arabic language is diminishing mm -hmm. incredibly. Um, it's not, literacy isn't the ability to read. It's the ability to comprehend and express yourself in that language. And uh, um, with, as we open up to the world, there's a huge risk that in an attempt to accept others, we forget that. Without the Arabic language, we basically lose all our history, we lose all the great publications that are there. Um, you see now a lot of grandparents speaking to the grandchildren in English, yes, yes. Um, because the kids, um, in an attempt to be competitive in a global market, are entering international schools. And so the grandparents don't speak English, but the, they are learning a couple of words and they're having to converse with their grandchildren. So for me, I think cultural institutions, nonprofit institutions, whether through art, theater, film, uh, literature, books, translation, podcasts, whatever, need to make sure that the Arabic language stays relevant, modern, um, and accessible as, the, as this entire region um, globalizes and opens up. I agree with you on this because we all are learning um, the profession in English. Sure. So even eloquently, there are words that you don't even know how to say in Arabic. And unless you've learned them in that language and you've learned about them and how do you articulate them, that's very important. And I think schools now are picking up on that. Yeah. <laughs> and we can see a little bit of a push, but it needs a lot of campaigning and a lot of involvement in a lot of uh, different places. So when there's knowledge transfer, like you were talking about the students, it actually stays and we are, modern to it. It's not something that we're just about our past. But I think um, what I would like to see in the next decade, I think is um, it has to do a lot more with artists and creators. Uh, for me, I feel like the region needs to come back together. We need to come back together in the way that we're creating, in the way that we're speaking, and also to allow the opportunities for creators to happen like it doesn't at this moment there's so much struggle and it's so to a lot of point elitist to uh, <laughs> and it's very hard to come by where even if you're a creative person one percent of those people are the ones who go into the creative field yeah. the rest go into corporate into doing anything because again whether that is parents pressure uh, culture or just there are no opportunities that they had or could see a way of, a of making a living, becoming a creator, an artist, because uh, I say creator, because not everybody is an, considers themselves an artist. Um, so there are multiple um, words for this, and especially being multidisciplinary, you need to allow people to be multidisciplinary. You cannot let them be, you're only a painter, you're only a photographer, you're only, because we're not, the, we're not that anymore. We are multidisciplinary in everything that we do and we're multi-talented. So that's a, something that needs to be more widely accepted, but also comprehended through the organizations that allow for people to be able to work through it. Yeah. Um, so my wish for the next 10 years is we develop the abilities to tell our uh, own uh, stories. We shouldn't wait for Netflix to produce the go-to uh, docu-series about Queen Cleopatra. It should be, you know, the likes of uh, NBC, for example, producing it. And we have, uh, we have the means and we have the talent and we should be aiming to be going uh, global uh, for various reasons. Uh, one of them is out of an agenda or out of ignorance. The stereotype in Arabs 
of Arabs, and particularly in Hollywood, hasn't been very positive. If you look at the works of the late and magnificent Professor Jacques Shaheen, who wrote the famous book Real, uh, R-E-E-L, uh, Real Bad uh, Arabs, I think out of a thousand films, uh, the, port the po positive portrayals of, of Arab were around 14%. Mm. Um, so, um, you know, anybody who's mingled with the fine audience here uh, in this room can attest that we're not all terrorists. And uh, we are, uh, some of us are very successful, not so successful journalists, but some very successful doctors and engineers and uh, coders. And uh, I think all of those stories need to be uh, told, but we need to stop relying on others to tell our stories. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, I agree. Kidding. Uh, to summarize it, I think we need to switch from a content consumption to a content creation mm -hmm. uh, society. That's one. For that, I think we need four things. Some to continue. We need governments that are supportive and they're investing. We have that today. We need that to continue. We need audiences that appreciate arts and culture, and that's basically by exposing them to not only events as adults and experiences, but also education as their children and extracurricular activities and so on. And we need a private sector that is engaged and that is supportive. So if you look at the history of culture, a lot of the classics today came from patronage mm -hmm. and came from private sector basically funding works being made. Uh, the US is one way where this has taken an extreme form where it's the only thing that's keeping the sector going. In Europe, it doesn't exist as much because everyone relies on governments. We're in an opportunity where we can actually create the best of both worlds and have both supportive governments and a private sector that is appreciative and supportive. Of the, and then finally, what, the area maybe that we have the least of yet, we need a, a cultural ecosystem where not only you want to be an artist, but you also have organizations that you can belong to, that guide you, that help you, institutions. You know, these exist everywhere else in mature culture sectors, but they don't exist in ours. And if you don't have these, even if you have passion and you're told to do it and you don't, you're still on your own mm -hmm. somehow. And you need, you need somebody to hold you and to uh, put you under their wing. So if we have all of those things in the next uh, 20 years, let's say. That's the goal. We're going I hope to. everyone in this room can sort of like contribute to that. Um, I hope you've enjoyed this conversation as much as I have. Thank you all so much um, for sharing all of the insights that you've had, but also for all the amazing work that you're doing to making sure that the sector continues to develop and hopefully will deliver on all of the f things that you've, you've shared here to see in the next decade and beyond. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.